you're okay with us recording? Oh yeah. Good. And so one thing is um, oh, we've got the okay. you want to, yeah, yeah, there there we go. Go. yeah, just did the, got it. As if I mentioned that clams live about 150 years, these ones, which is pretty respectable for a clam, I would think. But it's not that that long in terms of climate records. You know, if you're a tree and you're living a thousand years, that's a little more impressive. But what we can do is excavate dead material to extend those histories farther back in time. And so at this, this location where we had great success with long-lived individuals and a good climate signal, we sent divers out to excavate a pit where they could, um, here's, here's the divers in action, you vacuum out the sediments and then here they are pulling out the dead clams as they get deeper, 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 deeper. It was about a two meter pit that they did. The deeper you go, presumably the farther back in time. And so here they are uh, pulling out some of the mud and excavating the clams. In the bag that's being prepared to be shipped to my lab, there's a couple living in, uh, gooey duck there too. So we got several hundred of these gooey duck from this site and a couple others. And here's the hall from Tree Knob that they managed to, to uh, dig up. And then for us, it was a big puzzle matching process of um, trying to uh, prepare and measure these clams. So, you know, we cut them through the middle here, embed them in epoxy resin, and then put them on a high speed saw, get a really nice finish on it. And then we can uh, polish it really well uh, to resolve the growth increments. And again, here's another example of, of gooey duck growth increments. A couple of really excellent undergraduate helpers to just pump through hundreds of these shells and what was a real big numbers game. And then what we can do is start to pattern match all these dead collected individuals with the live collected individuals. Uh, so here's, for instance, a dead individual in red, the pattern matches in, and this one, and keep building, building, building back through time, and matching dead collected shells also with one another. So it's this big puzzle matching process, and we had, uh, we developed some R coding to help with that too, this ring data software that you can dump in a whole bunch of measurements and it can help you help guide the process of pattern matching which we uh, can corroborate visually but um you know it's piecing together this big puzzle of gooey duck back through time and this is what we got here for our segments of uh of gooey duck where each of these black lines is the lifespan of a single shell and we have a continuous record back to about 1725 and then we have other of these so-called floating chronologies or floating in time to cross date with one another uh, that we could radiocarbon date to get an idea generally where they fit in time um, to, to piece together and get reasonable coverage back over the last thousand years uh, and certainly this continuous one back to 1700 and Dave Edge who is a PhD student in geosciences has just published this paper it came out a couple months ago so this is our first real long gooey duck chronology now, which we will hope to continue to add to. But here's what the growth increments look like for the well replicated segments. And the blue line is an instrumental record of temperature for the British Columbia coast. But a nice uh, record of that Northeast Pacific climate. And here it is again, just zoomed in on this more recent 1700 to present, give you an idea of the variability and how it uh, matches up with the instrumental record. And so beyond the regional signals of climate on the British Columbia coast, we're also interested in basin-wide climate signals. And the uh, North Pacific famously varies from decade to decade, uh, or in these interdecadal cycles, which has generally been known as the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, where it oscillates between, kind of, or well, flip-flops, at least between a warm phase and a cool phase. Um, and these warm phases have anomalously warm temperatures right along the coast, uh, and a, a strong elution low. And then uh, the opposite here in this cool phase, and whenever you flip flop through these regimes, it completely reorganizes the marine system and um, ecologically. It also influences snowpack, rainfall, and fires in Western North America and beyond. So, as of interest to understand what's the history of Pacific decadal variability, and could gooey duck provide us some insights? as to what that might have been. And here's, again, the, the flip-flops here, the PDO, 
with these warm and cool phases over the 20th century and they'll go warm for a while and then cool and warm and cool every 20 to 30 years or so. And there have been attempts from trees to reconstruct the specific decadal variability, but it's they're in famously poor agreement with one another. And so I'm hoping that, that the gooey duck might provide some sort of tiebreaker or insight here as to what that, that history might be like. And I think, um, first of all, is to choose the most relevant index possible climate index and so that the Pacific decadal oscillation is the dominant sea surface temperature pattern in the North Pacific for the whole basin and that's after you detrend for the global warming uh, signal so the PDO doesn't include the warming trend that's it's removed that really enhance that interdecadal pattern but uh, if you we can recalculate the dominant pattern of sea surface temperatures for just the Northeast Pacific and retain that warming pattern. And this, this signal is known as the arc pattern because it, uh, it correlates so strongly. Uh, the red time series is this, this, the, the, this temperature pattern for this region of the Pacific. And this is the correlation between this red line and the actual temperatures in the Northeast Pacific. And the peak correlations follow this arc along the coast, hence this name, the arc pattern. But the red line is this dominant temperature pattern for the Northeast Pacific as compared to the PDO in gray. So there's quite a difference. So if you're targeting the PDO, you're, you're targeting a very distilled picture of what Northeast climate variability was. And here we're going to be more interested in what this dominant arc pattern is uh, for the Northeast Pacific and use that as our target for a climate reconstruction. And so this is what the arc pattern in red looks like uh, relative to the gooey duck. So a uh, reasonable fit there. Um, and it, it's a bit longer, goes back to about 1900, is somewhat questionable to be before 1920, but has a, a good fit to the gooey duck. So it provides one context. And then we, I think we can bring the trees back in as well. So there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of chronologies throughout Western North America and Asia, uh, Eastern Asia shown as each of these gray dots being a tree ring chronology. And so the question is, how does that gooey duck chronology relate to the tree ring chronologies? And is there a strong, stable relationship between this much longer gooey duck record in the trees than just the instrumental record in the trees? And we can look at that a couple of different ways um, where we can just remove the higher year to year, higher frequency year to year variability from the gooey duck. So the gooey duck is the, the black line and a, I can fit a smoothing spline to it as the heavier smooth black line and break this into its components where here's the spline, that's the lower frequency long-term component in the gooey duck. And then what's left over is the higher frequency component. And I'm really curious about this higher frequency component. If we strip that out of the gooey duck and strip it out of the trees, do we see strong stable relationships? Because sometimes you get fires and disturbances and they'll cause these big long pulses in trees. But if you strip out just the high frequency variability, it might give you a real conservative estimate between the gooey duck and the trees. And if we do that, um, there's just another illustration here with the arc and arc SST and the gooey duck, and then their high frequency components for the instrumental. But let's take this really long gooey duck and compare it to the tree ring chronologies. And then these are the correlations we get. That's um, you know, really beautiful correlations with these coastal uh, tree ring chronologies, which are almost all mountain hemlock. So really uh, remarkably strong correlations with that gooey duck chronology and trees on land. So it may be possible to put them together in some sort of multi-proxy reconstruction, see what the marine side says, see what the terrestrial side says. Although I was also interested not just in the overall correlation, but its stability over time. So we have this really long gooey duck record, and it is the correlation between the gooey duck and trees stable? So what we have is uh, we can split the time series in half. So from about 1720 to 1860 is the early half, and from 1860 to 1990, the latter half. And so what's my correlation between gooey duck and each of these tree ring chronologies in the early part of the of the chronology of back in the seven or 1700s early 1800s and then i can subtract the difference between the correlation in the modern half minus the correlation from that early half long ago and see if there's a shift 
And that's what this y-axis is. It's just the difference in correlation between the early part of the data set and the latter half of the data set. And what we see is that uh, tree ring chronologies that used to correlate negatively with gooey duck are now shifting in a way that they're becoming more positively correlated with gooey duck. And then the opposite for those tree ring chronologies that used to be positive, they're now shifting a bit toward the negative side. So there is some instability. Trees that used to be negatively correlated are becoming more neutral. Those that used to be positively correlated are headed in the opposite direction. But there is a group of chronologies that are uh, significantly related to GUI duck and stably related to GUI duck. And those are the ones we're interested in. These are the ones here. So there has been some shifting climate growth relationships, this would suggest, which might indicate why some of these earlier reconstructions from trees have been uh, inconsistent. Brian, quick question. What yeah. was your uh, selection of trees based on here? Uh, this is the, the red dots are those that correlate significantly and consistently. The gray ones, I mean. The gray ones? Oh, just if they're in their, if they're in the international tree ring data. Got it, got it. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks. So if they're publicly available, plus some additional, this is all publicly available data with some screening. So, you know, this is the area we said, you know, if they're kind of stable, there's not more than a 0.2 shift in correlation and are significant overall. Let's have a look. And then this is also the correlation between the, the tree ring chronologies and the instrumental ARC SST record and those that are significantly correlated just in that high frequency domain. So you really get this, this coastal being uh, the, the place you want to look for chronologies to inform us about the Northeast Pacific. And so here's what um, those tree ring chronologies that correlate strongly with gooey duck and consistently what they all look like and the meaning of those in black. It's always positive. There's always positive correlations between gooey duck and trees. So you can just average them together, uh, normalize them and average them to get some history of what the trees say, um, especially where the trees are well replicated within this box. We have a bunch of tree ring chronologies contributing. And this is what the trees would say that that history of sea surface temperatures has been like for the Northeast Pacific with that arc pattern being the red line superimposed. And um, get a pretty good uh, reconstruction amount here, uh, R squared. But this is tree rings that are screened from the gooey duck and um, averaged together to get this um, reconstruction. And what we can do is screen the trees in a whole bunch of different ways. So here, this was a, this previous slide was an example. If we screen the trees just on the high frequency component, on their high frequency components compared to the GUI, or if we screen the trees just on the high frequency component of ARC SST, or what if we just uh, screen everything against the GUI duck unaltered against the trees unaltered, or what if we just take the first half of the GUI duck up to 1860s and compare that to the trees. What chronologies do we get then? And we can run this reconstruction a whole bunch of different ways, which pulls in a wider range of chronologies as we shift around the criteria for our screening. But then we can do a whole ensemble of reconstructions where each of these black lines is the reconstruction from trees chosen from a variety of different ways. And then the blue line is the gooey duck, and the red line is the uh, sea surface temperature instrumental. Um, and so there's really pretty remarkable agreement here uh, and consistency. A couple of places where the gooey duck diverge a bit from the trees, but not much. And so together are telling us a lot about this, this, uh, this history of Northeast Pacific temperatures. Um, and in particular, I am impressed by the warming trend that they both really uh, show here. So uh, this is the, the temperatures from the gooey duck and trees. Uh, anomalies uh, normalized to the uh, 20th century average. And so we get this big warming trend and up to this ultra warm uh, regime here in the recent years. And each of these black bars is where the temperatures are two standard deviations or more beyond the 20th century mean. So we're just getting into all this heat wave territory in the latter 20th century, early 21st century. And we can really see that you know, and the emergence of these blob heat waves through 2014 and 15, these are the temperature anomalies, especially in the winter. And then blob 2.0 in the summer of 2019, extremely warm uh, anomalous temperatures. 
with widespread implications for the Northeast Pacific as far as um, uh, just marine mammal die offs, seabird tie offs, uh, infiltration of species from the south that have never been there before, toxic algal blooms, entanglements of whales and fishing nets because they're moving to chase their prey, which are in different locations. Uh, just very, very uh, potent events that the gooey duck and the trees show this lead up to and corroborate with one another. Uh, so now we're just trying to fill in gaps of that gooey duck and would like to get a continuous thousand year record. So I got another batch of shells in my lab last week who were collected from the same site. So we just keep the numbers game going and push those records back in time. I would like to switch gears a little bit, kind of a two phase talk and um, probably because I think this might also be of interest here and uh, maybe folks who are interested in collaborating on these projects. But not only do the trees tell us about past climate events, but also natural disasters, hazards of the Northwest. And so it turns out that, you know, this area of the Northwest is very earthquake prone, especially under Seattle, Olympia, Tacoma, the Puget Lowlands region. And very famously, this coastal region here, uh, where we had, there were these cedar ghost forests that had uh, trees that died at the last major subduction earthquake that occurred in January of 1700. You know, I was sampling these trees and uh, determining the calendar year they died. They put this at some time in the winter of 1699 to 1700. And then there were uh, records from Japan that confirmed there was a tsunami that uh, had originated with no parent earthquake uh, on what turned out to be January 26th of 1700. But it was trees that started to pin down exactly what season that occurred for these big subduction, Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes. But here in Seattle, Tacoma, Olympia, there's, you have that threat of earthquakes, but they're also underlain by a, a series of shallower faults. Uh, and here are some of the fault zones. There's one that run right under here under Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia area, and then the Saddle Mountain Fault Zone that runs through the Eastern Olympic Mountains. And so um, there's uh, a history of, of dead trees that uh, we believe had died as part of this, of uh, earthquakes associated with these shallow faults. And the thing about these shallow faults is they're, they're shallow, and when they go, they can be more destructive than the big Cascadia subduction zone events, we think. And way back in 1992 now, uh, there was a group, Gordon Jacoby and others, who had dated some wood that, uh, from a big landslide that slid right into Lake Washington outside of Seattle, right, right in Seattle. Soils, trees, everything slid right in and uh, was buried. They managed to get some samples out of the lake. And there was another log that was buried in a sand lens from a tsunami in Puget Sound. It was excavated. And they showed that these trees pattern matched with one another, they cross dated. So they died at the same time and they radiocarbon dated to about 1100 years ago, specifically about 900 to 930 AD. But there was no specific date, and, uh, but it showed there was a potential for catastrophic earthquakes. If you go out to Alki Point on West Seattle, that's all uplifted 25 feet from Puget Sound from this event. You're standing on that fault, then goes across. You just sound that you can see it on the other side. Um, so a big event. And then the year since, there's been other wood found associated with uh, big quake events. The Lake Sammamish near Seattle, another big landslide in the Lake Sammamish. A big rock slide out here at the Hamahama River Delta at Hood Canal. More wood in this Price Lake, which was formed when the fault, a fault in the Saddle Mountain, the Saddle Mountain Fault uplifted we pounded a stream and flooded a forest. And then um, Dry Bed Lake is another one where there's a landslide and buried some wood uh, that all radiocarbon dated to about 1100 years ago. But is this all the same event? Was there a multi fault event here? Was this all one big event? Did it happen in sequence? The radiocarbon was not specific enough to disambiguate how, how quick in time or whether these were all one event or not. So this last couple of years, we've gone out and been sampling. So here's Price Lake, the default formed Price Lake. You see how big it is here with my collaborator, Brian Sherrod. Um, and here are some trees in that lake still that have been there for the last <coughs> 1100 years. 
And so we've gotten um, samples collected in the 80s and 90s for that first round of research in the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory collection. And then we've gone out ourselves now in, this, in May, finally got out uh, to do some field work. And so we have divers here who are using this big underwater chainsaw, hydraulic saw, to saw sections out of these trees. And here we had to build this big barge, the party barge with the, the pontoon here and this 300 pound generator, which you had to get out of a truck and take it a half mile down this trail and get it loaded up and out onto the water and uh, have the divers cutting here, which was a very slow process. But they could um, uh, sample these, these trees. Here's one lying on the side as kind of a warm up section. But the divers would have to get really deep and, and, and immerse themselves in the mud to cut these trees in order to get samples with bark with, uh, that would have the outer ring of when these trees die. Um, in fact, the, uh, this is where the fault runs right here. So the stream is cut through the fault. So these trees all died right when this fault thrust up. So we're sampling these and, you know, it'd take an hour to get a sample. Here's one of our bigger samples. This is four feet by four feet. So it's a big bar chainsaw and it would take hours to cut this blindly underwater, uh, but they managed to do it and get a nice section here right out to the edge. And now we could start to evaluate, okay, how did that Price Lake compare to samples from say Lake Sammamish? You can see these stumps out here from the landslide in the Lake Sammamish, Lake Washington, the Hamahama site. And so we could start cross-dating within and among sites. But the one thing we did not know is what year did the earthquake occur because there's no reliable chronology that goes back 1100 years or more in the Northwest. But what we could rely on is this big cosmogenic pulse and radiocarbon that occurred uh, following a big solar storm and bombarded the Earth with radiation. It caused this big pulse and radiocarbon uh, in the year 774. So that you can, if you sample year by year radiocarbon in these tree rings, you should be able to find a big jump from 774 to 775. Um, and so uh, what we did is kind of narrow down where we thought 774 was based on wiggle matching radiocarbon. And we knew that the trees died somewhere around 900 to 930. So we could get back to 774 area and send a bunch off for radiocarbon here. Uh, we cut out the rings and here's Charlotte Pearson helping me dissect manually. And she's done a real radiocarbon expert on this, which has been wonderful. She's in the tree ring lab. And then eventually we found it. So the, here's the radiocarbon uh, for our three main sites. And then boom, here's that big jump from 774 up to 775. So we could lock it in. And then we knew that if this is where 774 is, that our event happened in the year, in the, in the winter of 923-24. So these are the three tree ring chronologies across our three main sites with an end date of 923. You can really tell that nice, synchrony among them. They were all growing contemporaneously and died contemporaneously. And if you slide them back and forth past one another and calculate those correlations, they're much lower correlations than when you have them aligned such a date as at 9.23. And we know they all show the same pulse and radiocarbon at 7.74, so that we have the cross dating in the 7.74 corroborating them on all three sides. And when you look at the last growth increment, it's a completely formed 923. So that these trees all died sometime in the dormant season of 923-24 uh, and involved at least two quakes. So that here are the, the tree ring series and their end dates of 923. Actually, I need to update this. We have six more trees now that end in 923 at Price Lake uh, as death dates. So that indicates there was this massive quake in the Northwest that involved at least the Seattle Fault and the Tacoma Fault, either in one big event, which is likely because they're likely linked, or in a big double punch event where you'd have two quakes, one right after another, in a matter of days to weeks or possibly a couple months. But you can imagine how catastrophic that would be in a modern infrastructure, where you'd have quake one being about a 7.4, quake two is 7.5 soon after on already weakened infrastructure, where you'd have one great big magnitude 7.8. Uh, that would affect the entire region. And the other thing is, um, 
And then we have uh, one other sample from this dry bed lake that also died in 923. Um, and you know this this is the tsunami log also died in 923. So we had this big quake, a tsunami, all in that year, and underscores the potential of what can happen in this part of the world. It would be much more violent than even a Cascadian subduction quake. And there's even more wood out there. Uh, we didn't even include the Tacoma fault zone, which also has wood that radiocarbon dates to about the same time and is in this catfish lake, which we haven't yet sampled. But it's possible this fault also went at the same time. And that's one more question to address. Plus a colleague, Jesse Pearl, who is a PhD student here and worked as a postdoc at the USGS, has been sampling uh, wood that also radiocarbon dates to about that time from out of uh, the, the uh, mud flats of the southern Puget Sound. Although we're finding those trees died over a very long window and are not associated with this big violent event. There was some kind of other subsidence that's been occurring in the south Puget Sound that's independent. But uh, here we can use those same trees to tell us about the climate, also cross date with one another and tell us about the history of earthquakes in the region too, in, in combination with this big uh, Cosmogenic 774 pulse, which has been exciting to think about. And so, looking forward to continuing to expand that work. And overall, applying growth increments uh, across the landscape and seascape, we've got trees in the forest, tell us about the forest history and atmospheric history. Freshwater mussels to also form rings, tell us about rivers and lakes. Uh, near shore for the gooey duck and offshore for the rockfish, which I didn't talk too much about, but these fish live 100 years or more and also um, tell us great uh, climate stories of the, the Northeast Pacific. But it's been exciting to be able to merge across those chronologies and use the same exact techniques of cross dating uh, to get the annual resolution and be able to seamlessly compare among them since they're all developed using the exact same procedures. So anyway, so I'll uh, wrap it up here and take any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Brian. We've got plenty of time for questions. I'm going to turn the light on. Shorter is better this time of the semester. <laughs> That's not it, yeah. Uh, so, um, what, in addition to temperature alone, there are other things that control the growth of the tree, but what else does it? Does that complicate the, the temperature? Uh, maybe this happens on a very local scale, but what, what else controls the tree? Excellent point, and I, I think that's why tree knob, the, the site I used, works so well, as it has this more uh, well-mixed location. If you get really close in some of these coves or near freshwater inputs, the freshwater can influence. You can get a rainfall signal in the gooey duck as well. Um, slows down their growth? Uh, yeah, and I think there's food controls as well, uh, you know, productivity. It seems that that temperature is really well related to the metabolism of the, of the shell and its growth of the organism and its shell growth, but there is still a food signal in there. So it's it's good, but it's not perfect. Uh, and yes, I think that could be if, if something other than temperature is driving food and productivity, that could complicate the story for wet. Um, you know, we haven't even scratched the surface of what isotopes would tell us. I was you know, talking about that with cow hairs. There's a whole suite of things beyond just the width. I've been lucky that width works well, but that's a great point that there's more you can learn from those increments for sure um, as we apply other techniques. Yes? Yeah, the oxygen isotope record should tell you your, the, the, whether the freshwater in, input, and that might, might be another connection between what's going on in the terrestrial realm and what's going on in the marine yeah. realm. Maybe being a, basically a terrestrial signal. Yeah. And because do any, I mean, my impression, of course, from Arizona is it rains all the time up there. So um, <laughs> is, there, is, is there any tree response to unusually high precipitation that would produce, say, uh, more influx of fresh water into these coastal systems? Yes. Yeah, so lower elevation forests typically pick up a precipitation signal. It's a little weaker in the Northwest than if you go to California, you get the blue oak, and that's just winter precip, winter yeah. precip, winter precip, which is wonderful. Um, but it may be possible to explore some precipitation sensitive tree ring chronologies. And especially if you can use isotopes to help disambiguate precipitation or salinity from the temperature. If we assume the width is a good temperature record, 
and maybe the isotopes could provide that complementary perspective for the, uh, the gooey duck. And um, yeah, we here I'm using the temperature sensitive higher elevation trees. But there's a bunch of lower elevation and could pull in those precipitation signals as well. That's an excellent point. Yep. Yeah, another question, if I if, if I may, I mean, gooey ducks, of course, are sort of signature marine invertebrates for the Pacific Northwest. Um, the other marine organism that people really care about, of course, are salmon. Yeah. Is there any connection between the sort of work that, say, Vinny has done with yeah. uh, the salmon, the salmon uh, otoliths and, and, and records of productivity in, in lakes and such? Yeah, I think that the Finney data are going to be worth investigating. Uh, that marine-derived nitrogen gets brought in by the salmon and then yeah. the sediments that he's done. And those seem to be pretty high resolution, if close to annual at least. So that maybe you could see decadal variability, but those records are out there. And I corresponded with Bruce a couple of years ago as I was getting started with this, and it's going to be worthwhile to reestablish those connections and say, okay, here our gooey duck chronology is published. Let's that would be another record to verify or you know explore to see if there is some similarity because we would expect those salmon. I mean, that's how the PDO was described first, right? As the yeah. salmon catches and right. So they're clearly responding to that ocean variability, and if there's paleo records of the salmon, which there are, we'd expect those to show up against uh, what we have here from Huey Duck and, and Three. Yep, that's a great point. And be totally dependent, right? Which is, is a real bonus. Um, first of all, this, this using the tree chronology to pinpoint these earth probes, this is really fascinating. This is really cool. Um, and you talked a lot about um, specifically some lakes that were dammed during these earthquake events. And I'm curious what the effect was on Puget Sound in a more general sense of the circulation of Puget Sound in the marine realm and whether there's a, an equivalent gooey duck chronology that you could build and perhaps pair with isotope geochemistry to be able to look for these targeted earthquake events. And understand yep. something about marine circulation. Yep, uh, you bring up an excellent point. And I would, you, you'll notice that our gooey duck chronology goes to 1725, which is so close to the 1699, 1700 that I'd love to have seen for that subduction quake, uh, especially if you got into Puget Sound and everything sunk a meter. That's got to have some kind of growth signal, you would think, on the gooey duck. So if you could get in, well, one of our sites is in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and we didn't get as many dead shells as we'd like, but you could go back, I bet. And that would be excellent to see, do you see a distinctive anomalous growth pattern that's an indicator of these subduction quakes? And that would be exciting. Um, or if you got right in Puget Sound too, and could get back a thousand years to 923, uh, that would be neat too. Uh, but one other way the gooey duck feed into the earthquake story is, if you could go back a thousand years, you know, the big quakes send landslides of sediment down off the continental shelf and slope, these turbidites that you can date roughly. Um, but there's the marine radiocarbon reservoir effect where that radiocarbon gets mixed in with the ocean. And then depending on ocean circulation, it varies how much radiocarbon you have at any one time. But whether the gooey duck can help constrain that marine radiocarbon reservoir effect over time and help narrow the dates from the turbidites or other indicators in the Northeast Pacific would be another interesting use to, to mill the radiocarbon from the gooey duck, which we played with a little bit, but uh, need to get a little farther back in time for that to really be of use. But in, in that way, that the gooey duck would complement the trees on the earthquake side of things, too. Other questions from students? Yes. Are there any other indicators of the uh, earthquake in 923, like any Uh, yeah, you can see this. There's been trenching, uh, and LIDAR is, is used to find the Tacoma Fault in the early 2000s. This is kind of subtle, you know, through those forested landscapes. I'm not, I think that was from the early 2000s it was discovered. Um, and the thing about these, uh, the big shallow quake in 923 that's remarkable is all the landslides that apparently occurred when these trees slide in multiple places. Lake Sammamish in Washington, Hannah Hand slide, these other slides. Like Will and I have co published a paper looking for landslides in the coast range dating 
and of Oregon dating uh, landslides um, that had impounded streams and drowned forests, thinking that all those landslides would date to the 1700 Cascadia event. But none did. And it was all these you know, rainfall events, we think, maybe atmospheric rivers that are activating these landslides, but not big quakes. But what did trigger a bunch of these landslides is that shallow faults of the of Puget Lowlands, which I think speaks to their power, a special ability to really cause damage, even relative to the Cascadia subduction zone. So, you know, there's abundant geologic evidence of how intense that shaking was in the Puget Lowlands area. Not to mention just that upthrust in the, the sandlands from the tsunami. You know, we can imagine a tsunami going up Puget Sound and causing the sandlands with a tree buried in it. It just it's not sound like a good situation. So, uh, there are those strong indicators. Brian Hoska question. Uh, yeah. I'll actually ask two questions. One uh, is uh, what what is, what is the etymology of gooey duck? Uh, <laughs> and uh, as someone from the Eastern Hemisphere where these guys don't exist, uh, I've always, when I first encountered the term, I pronounced it geoduck. Uh, so I'm just curious what the etymology is. I think um, there's yeah, some carryover from the Native American pronunciation. Is it? Oh, is that so? It has a native etymology. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Uh, and uh, my my question is, you know, you kind of uh, plateau off with your chronology at about 1700. When when do you guys? Yeah, 1720s. 1720, 1720s. Okay. Uh, and so is the limitation really just how deep you can go or are there, or are there other growth rate related limitations yep. or biological limitations yep. that make you hit that wall? Two things is chewy duck like other long lived organisms do sweepstakes recruitment. So when you live a long time, usually you have just a few points in your life when there's big bursts of reproduction. And you know, you broadcast spawn and just all the stars align and everything settles out, and you get a big reproduction event. And that's part of the reason managers are interested in the gooey duck, is with this tree knob, say every 80 or 100 years between major recruitment events. So you're working against these pulses of recruitment, and you can get yourself gaps if you go a long time without recruitment of these guys. And you know, we wonder too if they're migrating in and out as uh uh, conditions warm and cool over much longer time scales. Mm. But um, I think it's really going to be a numbers game and you know, to, to deal with these recruitment pulses is sampling multiple places within a few hundred meters of one another and uh, just getting the numbers up. I think it's going to be luck of the draw. So it's not necessarily going deeper, it's also going where they're at. Yeah, because we've gone the deeper shells, one of them, you know, at least one of our shells is over 2,000 years. Oh geez! From the pit, so wow. they're preserved. So there's now. some hiatus that's that they were they're not there, and there may be hiatuses, or yeah. there may be this just reproductive stochasticity. And well, as in, that's what I mean—that they weren't physically there at all uh, from 1700 to 2,000 years ago, or something. That's a possibility. Yeah, and they might have been over here. Instead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which I hope is the case. So this batch I have in my lab now is from a nearby area. And we're hoping we'll have some gaps to fill in, or to fill the gaps that we have in the chronology at present. So, you know, this frequently happens uh, with trees too, and we just keep keep sampling, keep processing, and the more more success begets more success. You get more and more individuals. And these are the ones the ones I show are dated, but we have hundreds more where we have the measurements, but they don't match with others yet. But as we add more and more. Chances of continuing a continuous technology, and maybe being overly optimistic, but I'm hoping that's the case, is increasingly likely to succeed and get a millennial like history, which would be twice as long as a tree ring chronology. Yeah, in the region. that's great. Any other questions for Brian? I would encourage student questions if you have any. Okay, all right, well, let's give a round of applause for Brian. Thank you very much, Brian. And I would encourage you all who are interested to contact Brian and, and have discussions with him. Before you leave, if you can just uh, turn your tables uh, for the classroom proceedings, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, thank you.
stop this recording. Uh, just uh, together with this one. We're done. Okay.